We are often told, God loves you. But what does that really mean? That some impersonal force, galaxies away, may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe He has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are His child, created in His image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, He's carefully constructing the events of your life to build His kingdom. If you are willing... He can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you. Good morning and welcome. I am so glad that you joined us from your home or wherever you may be today for this time of worship. And as that video message that you just watched reminded you and me of, God loves you. That love has made him do everything necessary to save us and to make us his very own dear precious children. It is that love that moves us, by the way, to love Him back, to believe in Him and to trust Him and His Son, Jesus Christ, and to worship Him for who He is and what He has done for us in Christ Jesus. Today, by the way, we are observing the festival of Christ the King. This Sunday completes the year-long cycle of what historically is known as the church calendar year. On this festival, we acknowledge and give thanks to Christ for reigning over us in grace and love and compassion. By the way, next Sunday we move into the season of Advent, and we have a very special sermon series which will launch next Sunday on November 29th. We are going to rediscover the meaning of Christmas and the hope, peace, joy, and love that is ours even during these uncertain, troubling, and discouraging times, and during these times when our friendships and our connections and relationships are being buffeted because of needing to distance ourselves from one another. By the way, we have a daily devotional reading booklet to go along with this sermon and worship series for December. So give us a call or send us an email and learn how you can get a hold of a copy. But let's now move into the time of worship together, joining our hearts and minds and spirits, and giving praise and glory to the Lord, our awesome, loving, caring, and compassionate God. May His glory shine on us. His love surround us. His power fill us. His grace free us. And His Holy Spirit unite us. Amen. So we gather and make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, eternal, almighty, everlasting one, we are here to worship you in all your splendor and glory. We are here to 
hear the, the fire of your truth and to acknowledge your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior King. Yet we recognize and confess that so often we fail to keep you first in our lives and we fall short when it comes to living our lives out in obedience to your commandments. Almighty God, we are sinful people. We sin against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We remember that it was for our sins that you sent Christ to a cross to die. And it was for our justification that you raised Christ from the dead. Forgive us our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Purify our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit. And fill us with your goodness. So that we seek always to love and to follow you. Amen. God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to Him. He is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For the sake of His Son, Jesus Christ, God has forgiven you all your sins. May He keep you in His grace by the Holy Spirit, lead you to greater faith and obedience, and bring you to live with Him forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture praise comes from Philippians chapter 2, the ninth and 10th verses. God has highly exalted Christ Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
worship you our King. Our first reading is the 10th chapter of the book of the prophet Daniel. It serves as our focus for study as we continue our series, Living Fearlessly Wild for God, as well as Pastor Byer's text for his message. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar, and the word was true and was a great conflict, and he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, As I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Upjaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of uh, his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words. As I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep, with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words as I speak to you, and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for you... For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come before, uh, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For, this, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come to, upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And he spoke to me. I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I, w- but I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the Festival of Christ the King is taken from St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom uh, kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God and praise be to Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the St. Mark's Kids Chat. A um, couple of announcements before we get started. Um, there was a few things that we handed out at our Fall Family Fun Day, um, which was on Saturday. If you were not able to make it there with your kiddos, um, we have some things that you can swing by the church and pick up. Um, the first is this little Christmas Hidden Pictures activity book. It has um, It's like a fun coloring book where it has a whole bunch of hidden things in here that you can find on the page. It's lots of fun. Um, we also made for you guys... Um, something that you can put together at home. Um, this is a little um, paper advent chain. So it has a little star at the top, and then you add a new loop each day, um, starting on the first day of Advent. It's kind of like a countdown until Christmas. Um, and then we also have an Advent calendar that we will be handing out to everybody as well. So if you didn't get a chance, um, swing by the church and pick it up, or you can call the church office and they can mail it to you. Um, so let's get into our lesson. So it, we are in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. And it's all about of, um, the story of when Isaac was born. So do you guys remember who Isaac is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's Isaac? Um, Isaac is Abraham's son. Abraham. Yes, Abraham and Sarah's son. So um, finally they had a baby. And how old were they? Do you guys remember how old they were? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They were old, right? 100. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham was 100 yes. and Sarah was 90 years old, right? Mm -hmm. So remember last week when we talked about those three visitors that came and visited Abraham and they told them, they said, I'm going to come back in a year and Sarah's going to be 90 years old and you're going to have a baby of your own flesh and blood. So, do you remember what Sarah's um, reaction was to that? Sarah laughed. She, oh, 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 did oh, laugh. Oh, oh. she did laugh. She did laugh. And did you know that it's kind of interesting that if you, um, the, the name Isaac actually means he laughs. That's what that means. Isaac, the name Isaac means he laughs. So, um, which is kind of interesting because, you know, Sarah at the time, she kind of had like a, kind of like a disbelieving laugh, like, like a nervous laugh, right? Like, wait a minute, wait, I'm going to have a baby at 90 years old. It was almost like she couldn't believe it. Right. So, but also she was like. That's but also, impossible. Well, yeah, I mean, right, but are, are things impossible for God? No. No, exactly. So Sarah had that kind of that nervous, you know, disbelieving laughter. Um, but when Isaac was born, he brought a whole different kind of laughter, right? He brought that joyful laughter. Like, have you guys, you guys have probably seen little babies, right? They're so cute when they're born, like when Max was born and when Sawyer was born. You guys brought so much joy and laughter to our lives. And so... Um, that's why they named him that was um, he laughs because everyone was kind of just like in this joyful laughter that Isaac was born. He was such a gift. So speaking of gifts, um, I want you guys to come have a seat here down here and we're going to do a little activity about gifts. So I'm going to bring our little camera down here. Alrighty. And I have this little cup of water right here. Okay. So, and what we're going to do is um, we are going to show you this little gift right here. Okay. Do you see this little, this little present, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Isaac was a gift, right? Was Isaac a gift? Can you come in here? Sorry, I can't quite see you. Okay. So Isaac, he was an, an amazing gift. Why was he an amazing gift? Why do you think? Um, they didn't think that he, they would actually have a kid, but they did. They did, exactly, right? And so um, did they think that this gift of a child would come at such an old age? No. No, right? I mean, but it, it happened, right? And so this gift, you know, of Isaac was, you know, seen through at first, um, you know, a lens through Sarah as she was kind of laughing nervously, right? L last mm -hmm. week when we talked about that in our 11. In our lesson, she was a little bit nervous, but God, you know, sees 
Isaac as a gift in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. In a much different way. He is an amazing gift. So what I want you to do, I want you to take a look at this picture, right? Mm -hmm. Do you notice that the bow is on this side right here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Max, move your elbow over just one second. Sorry, why don't you come into the frame over here? Can't quite see you. Um, watch the present as I um, bring it over here towards the water. So keep watching it. Keep watching it. Well, what do you notice? It went to the other side. It went to the other side. So let's do that one more time. Which side is the present bow on? That one. This side. And then watch it as we go into the water. It goes to the other side. It goes to the other side. So can we, this just reminds us that sometimes we see gifts differently than the way God does, right? Mm -hmm. So God saw Isaac in, as an amazing gift. And eventually, you know, um, Sarah and Abraham saw him as such an amazing gift too. But at first they were like, wait, what's going yeah. on? Like, like, what do you mean I'm going to have a baby at 90 years old or in a hundred years old for Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. That was, um, pretty amazing. So sometimes, you know, like Sarah, she was a little nervous at first. Like, what do you mean I'm going to be this old to have a baby? But then she realized once Isaac was born that how much of an amazing gift he really was, I'm right? I can try doing it with my hand. You can try doing it with your hand? Oh. Whoa, <laughs> look at that. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so gonna... let me ask you something. Let me ask you something. Um, Isaac was a son who was a gift, right? Can you think of another person who was a gift to us? Can you think of, or even just in general, in your life, who was a gift to you? Who was a gift who was a person to you? Max is your gift? Aw, that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. That's so sweet. And so what about what about somebody else? Uh, let me give you a hint. It was also somebody who was born, right? And it's also someone who we read the Bible about. Mm -hmm. And it's also someone whose birthday is next month in December. Can you think of... Jesus. A Jesus. Yes, exactly, right? So Jesus was such a gift, such a gift to so many people. And at first, you know, we didn't really know, like how much of a gift he really is, right? So we sometimes just don't see what God's plans are, you know, with Jesus, right? But how is Jesus a gift to the whole world? He died on the cross, saved us from our sins. Exactly, right? But did we did we see it that way at first when he was first born? Did we know? We didn't know, right? So, but it, that's how everybody, they didn't quite know how much of a gift Jesus was also going to be. And so... We just need to remember that God gives us amazing gifts. So let's let's apply this also to our life in general, right? Like I'm gonna cover your face up here just for sec just a minute, Max. So see these things right here. This is like our morning chore chart, right? Can you see how the everyday things in our life can also be a gift? So what about like um, having to make your bed in the morning? How can we see that as a gift? What do you guys think? That it actually looks nice. That it looks nice or that you actually have a bed to sleep in, right? So what about like, um, I don't know, brushing your teeth? That's kind of a chore, right? To make sure your breath doesn't... <laughs> that your breath doesn't smell, yeah. right? Or, or that maybe you have clean, healthy teeth so that you don't get cavities, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can see that there's, there's so many gifts, it doesn't, doesn't have to be necessarily like a gift, you know, like a Christmas present or anything like that, right? So gifts also come in different forms. They come in the form of everyday things like this where we realize how much, how gifted we really are with everything in oh, our like life. packing your lunch. Packing your lunch so that you have something to eat, right? Mm -hmm. And then we also see that people are a gift, right? Like mm -hmm. you guys are a gift, right, yeah. from God to us. And mm -hmm. Jesus is also our gift, okay? So... I want you guys to keep that in mind as you go out there and remind everybody just how much of a gift Jesus is to us. Okay, everybody. See you later. Bye. 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 Call for songs of loudest praise.
Teach me some melody of sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming
Grace to you and peace from God the Father, the Sovereign and Mighty Savior, and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, Ruler, Caretaker, Preserver, and Redeemer, who by His death and resurrection has made us His brothers and sisters and heirs of His heavenly treasures, and the Holy Spirit, who makes His dwelling in us, who strengthens the faith that he has established in us so that we are able to endure in times of trial and are continually empowered to share his redemptive and restorative love with all people. In chapter 10 of the book of Daniel, we encounter a fourth vision that God gives to Daniel. It is a rather long vision that will actually continue to unfold and give interpretation to in chapters 11 and the final chapter of Daniel 12. So it is appropriate for me to go ahead in this message today to take a look at the whole of the vision spread out over these three chapters in this one concluding sermon on the book of Daniel. The vision, by the way, is all about preparation. God gives Daniel this vision in order that he prepare Israel and the church, which is in exile, to walk through significant trials that are coming their way in the future. The message of this vision presupposes a paradoxical truth. That truth is this. God greatly loves us, And yet he allows trials and hardships to come upon those he loves. It is seemingly contradictory to say that. To say that God loves us and yet allows persecution or cancer or unemployment or the loss of a home in a fire. And sometimes it's not even those extreme trials or hardships that get us down or derail us. Sometimes it's the lesser ones. God loves us and yet allows crazy weather, gridlocked traffic, a civic call to isolate and separate from one another and shelter in place because of a global pandemic. Daniel's fourth vision also assumes God's sovereignty over geopolitical events through divine influence and interventions that change the world, and also the faces of the nation and their rulers. It is God who puts into place kings and kingdoms. That's one, been one of the messages of Daniel. It is God who puts presidents and governors and legislators and judges and corporate social media billionaires in place. And it is he also who takes them down when they operate contrary to his will and purposes or when their time for serving his good purposes is done. Our neighbors in the world around us, uh, they kind of scoff at this idea, this truth. They doubt that it really is happening, that God is really in control in that way. But this truth is taught in the Holy Scriptures. God is in control. The Old Testament character, Job, as he contemplated the world, the universe, the nature and working of man, of government, and even the trials that he was enduring, said of God, in his hand, is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. And back, of course, in chapter 4 of Daniel, we heard and we can remember how Daniel proclaimed to King Nebuchadnezzar 
with regard to his power and his reign and his kingdom being stripped away and taken away, Daniel said, All the peoples of the earth are counted as nothing, and the Most High God and King of heaven does as he pleases with the army of heaven and the peoples of the earth. There is no one who can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? As we read this vision and dig deeply into its meaning for us today, we are challenged to prepare ourselves to endure whatever trials the Lord may allow to come our way. And yet we need to do so anticipating that we can meanwhile live fearlessly wild for God and without fear or anxiety. And why? Why is that? <coughs> Daniel tells us in the text. He tells us why we can live fearlessly and wholeheartedly for God. It's because He loves us. And in loving us, He is for us and not against us. In loving us, He strengthens us to endure the difficult times. In loving us, He will give us what we need to preserve and to persevere. In love, loving us, He will ultimately rescue and deliver us and restore us. You see, in loving us, He is working all things out according to His right and holy and just purposes, and His purposes are always moving things along to be worked out for our good, even when some of those things are not so good, and trials come, and troubles come our way. So God's word to Daniel is God's word to you and me today, and He is saying to us, do not fear, and do not be anxious. Be at peace. Be strong. You are secure because you are loved by me. You see, you and I are God's treasures. And so we can live for God. We can serve God. We can work courageously for God, diligently for God, relentlessly doing what He has given us to do that He has spoken about in His Word. We can be loyal to God and trust Him and depend upon Him totally. This chapter also teaches us several interesting things about prayer and gives us some insight into why it sometimes seems that the answers to our prayers are delayed. Daniel, we read, had been mourning, fasting, and praying for three weeks before an angel appeared to him with an answer to his prayer. The angel, however, told him that God had heard his prayers on the very first day that he had begun to pray and fast. So the first thing that we see and learn here is that God hears our prayers immediately. The angel encouraged Daniel when he said to him, Yes, Daniel, your words were hear, heard. Second, we see that God was attentive to Daniel's prayer and answered Daniel's prayer immediately by sending the angel right at that moment, on that first day. Third, though the answer was sent right away, there was a delay in Daniel receiving it because behind the scene... There was a war between good and evil spiritual entities going on. An angel of evil and darkness was trying to undermine God's answer to prayer in the care that he was giving to Daniel and the church. And God dispatched his mighty angels of good, Michael and Gabriel, to overpower them and to set them down so that his answer and his grace could come to Daniel and the people of his day. And fourth, in spite of the spiritual opposition, that war between the evil one 
against God and against God's servant and God's servants, Daniel still nonetheless got his answer to prayer just at the right time. The answer to Daniel's prayer still arrived on time. And this teaches us that although we may often feel like God's timing is delayed with regard to our prayers, there is no such thing as God's answer coming too late to accomplish what He wants to accomplish. God never lacks the power to do His will, and He is never late in getting done what He wants done. These truths about praying then call for us to be Daniel-like prayers in our world today. You know, Daniel stayed in Babylon through the end of his life. He saw that his place of serving God and ministering to the church and to the citizens of his world around him was right there in Babylon not back there in Israel where he could have gone. He was choosing to to continue to serve God right where God had placed him intentionally in the first place and for much of his lifetime, right there in Babylon. And so he went about praying for the church, and he went about praying for his neighbors in the world, and he fasted and mourned and prayed that God's rescue and salvation would be experienced by everything in his new homeland as he would continue to pray for them and he wanted them to experience the same kind of redemption and restoration that God is willing to give to all people, especially restoration after the time they go through trials. And we remember Daniel as a remarkable man, uh, gifted with wisdom, Uh, discernment, understanding, and administrative abilities. And we remember him as a man of the Word, who read the Word, studied the Word, lived his life according to the Word of God. Yet what we must see in all of that is that this remarkable giftedness and faithfulness to God led him to become a man of prayer. Let me share a few concluding thoughts and applications that have emerged from the book of Daniel as we have studied and dug deeply into it over these past two months. And these thoughts, by the way, for me are like uh, icebergs. Uh, We have only seen the tips of something that is so much bigger and more formidable. The top of the iceberg, which we can see and do know and understand, is extraordinarily helpful to us, useful and inspiring. And yet we understand also that there is so much that we have not yet seen in the way that God continually loves us and works with our lives and is involved in our world. But here's some ideas I want to share with you in closing today. First, remember, you are loved and treasured by God. You are His masterpiece. He created you so that you would know and love and worship and serve Him. He made you His own dearly loved child by His own free will and choosing. Think of that. And He sealed your membership in His forever family through the work of Jesus Christ, His one-of-a-kind Son. Christ redeemed you. Christ purchased and won you, making you God's very own possession, His masterpiece, His prize, His treasure. He did so not with silver or gold, but with His holy, precious blood and His innocent suffering and death. You and I will never fully understand why God chose to save us and make us his own and pledge to keep us in his divine care forever through the work of Christ. But this is what he has said, and this is what he has promised, and how he would do it. 
This is his word and the expression of his will. And his word is infallible, unbreakable, and inviolable. We are loved and we are treasured by God. Second, you will face troubles, but God already has a plan to deal with each trouble or trial you will face before you encounter it. His plan will be put into place and at work to limit the scope and the intensity of the trouble and to give you strength and endurance during the trouble and to bring you through to a place of victory. See, his unlimited power and unmatched goodness are the ultimate authority in our world. And he is using them for your good and for the preservation of the church and its unstoppable growth and movement forward. So do not be afraid. Do not be anxious. Be at peace. Your future is secure. Third, proceed with your life and the work God has given to you. In response to one of Daniel's questions, Gabriel the angel, the messenger, told him that the answer would be revealed at the appointed time. And that's all he really needed to know about the matter. Daniel wasn't therefore to waste time in pursuing the answer to his question, nor was he to sit by and simply wait for the fulfillment of all prophecies so that they would come true and he would see it. Rather, he was to go his way, the text says, get on with his life and serve the Lord to the best of his abilities. You know, Daniel was a teenager when he was taken to Babylon from Jerusalem in the year 605 B.C., and he served successfully for at least 60 years, 60 years under four different powerful pagan rulers. And so while Jeremiah the prophet was back there at home in Jerusalem and Judah taking care of the believers and the church back there at that time, and Ezekiel was there along with Daniel in exile in Babylon prophesying and speaking God's word, Daniel was at the center of political power and helping run the business of a nation. And all the while, as he did, he bore witness to and he worshipped the one and only true God, the holy God of heaven. He was serving God by witnessing to the lost, by advising the king and the ruler of the land, by caring for his neighbor in the world and the oppressed, and by preserving the church, and by being a man of prayer, and by his prayers calling down the unlimited power and the unrivaled goodness of God to change the world in which he lived. So my friends, dare to be a Daniel. Live life boldly for the good of others, for the good of the church, to fulfill the purposes of God, and in order to make his name famous and to give him glory. God will use you to change the world. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ unto life everlasting. Amen. Praising God for his goodness and for the atoning sacrifice made by Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins, thanking him for mercy by which he has saved us, Delightfully acknowledging he has made us his very own people by faith and baptism. Grateful that he hears and answers our prayers, giving to us his good gifts. We are bold to confess him to be our Savior, King, and ever-present helper in the ancient creed of the church, the Nicene Creed. Join me, please. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My dear friends, this is the time when if we were gathered here in God's house together, uh, we would continue our worship by giving opportunity for all present to offer their gifts to the Lord as a gift of worship. We can't uh, pass the offering plates, of course, amongst us today by way of this service, but you can take the opportunity to worship the Lord and present your offerings to Him, either by sending your gifts to the church office uh, by mail or dropping them off, uh, or using our online giving mechanism that can be accessed on our church website. Your ongoing generosity and your support The giving of your tithes and offerings allows us to continue our ministry to one another as members of the body of Christ, as well as sustain our mission to the world around us, sharing the redemptive and restorative love of Christ with our neighbors and also responding in compassion to those who are in need. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Also, by the way, if you have a prayer request that you would like to have us give attention to, you can submit those to the church office. You can drop them off, put them in the mail, or get a hold of us, um, Debbie Lancina, in the office by email. Or just give us a phone call, and we'll make sure that we give attention to your prayer need. God bless you. Dear God, I know I'm supposed to be thankful in all things, in all the seasons through trials and tribulations and good times and bad. But here I am in the middle of it, sad and overwhelmed. The world as I knew it is gone. People I love are suffering. The life I walk through is suddenly no more. I can't gather around a table and celebrate family. I can't hold hands with those I care about. Instead, grief and despair seem to be eager dinner guests. God, I don't feel like celebrating. But I sit at my table and I close my eyes, listening for that still, small voice, the one that always manages to rise above all the noise of this life. I hear you, above the sadness, above the fear, above the bewilderment of all that has happened this year. There you are, whispering, be still and know that I am God. And I close my eyes, and I take a deep breath, and I find my thankfulness in a God who is still in control. Amen. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, Ancient of Days, Sovereign Lord and King, Abba Father, we thank you for your unfailing love, your never-ending mercy, and your indefatigable compassion toward us. And we thank you for establishing with us an everlasting covenant through the finished work of your Son, Jesus Christ. We rest secure and content in your unconditional love, your perfect peace, and your sovereign rule. Increase our faith and trust in you, so that when trials and storms, turmoil or distressing circumstances threaten to shake our faith or remove our hope, help us to cling to your promises, which are unbreakable and indestructible. Thank you for forgiving our sins, for not treating us as our sin or sinfulness deserves. Thank you for covering and keeping us in your grace. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit that drives us to love you for having first loved us. We praise you for your goodness and provision that sustains and preserves our lives day by day and pray that you will care for the ill, sick, and afflicted. Grant them healing, health, wholeness, and well-being in body, mind, and soul. Bless us with treatments and remedies that help rid us of disease and illness. Sustain and preserve our lives according to your goodwill and purposes. Be with the elderly, the weak, and the infirm, keeping strong their faith and hope in you for the sustaining of their lives now and for the renewal of life that will come to them in heaven. Console those who mourn, comfort those who have suffered loss, Be an ever-present companion to the lonely. Care for the needs of the poor, hungry, infirm, homeless, and the helpless. And use us as your instruments of mercy and compassion as we endeavor to share your redemptive and restorative love with all people. Direct those who govern over us by your word and will, that we may be blessed in our country, state, and community, and that we may live in peace, and in a spirit of mutual respect and kindness toward one another. Defend us against all evil, and from the powers of this broken world, including fire, earthquake, civil unrest, injustice, terrorism, racism, and violence. Give us the attitude of gratitude for all the blessings you have lavished upon us, and a spirit of generosity and cheerful giving as we invest the treasures that you have given to us in the work and mission and ministry in the extension of charity of your church. Abba Father, giver of every good gift, also grant all that we would need to sustain our lives, that we may continue to love, serve, and give you constant glory and honor, and to your great and holy name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands we commend all these for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now according to his promise, and as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Go now, in the peace and love of Christ. Have courage, and hold on to what is good. Strengthen your fellow believers, help the suffering, open doors of faith by telling the good news, declare the great things God has done for you, be a light to the nations that his salvation may be made known to all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit Abide with you. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great reading. 
Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Hallelujah. 